welcome to episode 24 of the tomato timer and today we are obviously having a youtuber because we have video today um ali is joining us a practicing doctor in the uk he graduated from cambridge in 2018 um and he is while he's not youtubing he's also the founder of six med where he's helping medical students get into university so ali thank you so much for your time and joining us today thanks for having me this is exciting i've never done a thing on discord before I feel like I'm kind of joining the cool yeah. kids club, as it were. Thank you. You you you're definitely cooler now. Um, yes. Ali, tell us a little bit <laughs> about um, like I want I want to hear not when you were cool kind of thing. You've you know you've done what most people dream of doing. You've become you've you've studied medicine. You've studied it at one of the best not one of the best the best university in the world. Um, you've then gone about setting up YouTube channel, which has hundreds of thousands of people watching your videos. Um, you've set up a company and made that successful. You've achieved what many people dream of, but I want to hear the alley of kind of 16, 17, um, going through his GCSEs, A-levels and thinking about what he wanted to do in the, in his, in his life. And, and how did, how did it all kind of start? Hmm. I guess, uh, when you're brown and you get reasonably good results, it's just a standard thing that you're probably going to do medicine. Uh, I always quite liked coding uh, and I used to make websites and stuff when I was young. And so it was sort of a choice between medicine and computer science. But I kind of reasoned around about the age of 16 that it would be more interesting to be a doctor who knows how to code on the side than it would be to just be someone who codes. And so that was sort of the main thing that led me towards medicine. And then once you've decided on that and you're a massive nerd uh, and not very cool, then it's just a case of optimizing, you know, playing playing the exam <laughs> results game. and you know, there are efficient and less efficient ways of playing that game. But you sort of recognize that, all right, this is a game that I'm playing. I'm going to go all in and kind of do what it takes to get the grades. And essentially, when it comes to getting into university for medicine, it's mostly just based on grades. If you have very good grades, you'll have a very easy time getting in. If you have less good grades, you'll have a very hard time getting in. It, it is unfortunately that simple with, with, with most of these things around, around applying to medicine. So it's just about playing the game, really. And then, so, so a lot of our kind of listeners and, and, and viewers today are going to be thinking about applying to medicine. And the grades is the kind of the tough part. It's almost like a filtration system that universities use to, you know, get a certain class of people in, in one kind of category. And then certain people are, uh, have a kind of more difficult time getting in. I know that you talk a lot about um, optimizing your studying and learning process, your revision um, process itself as well, being more productive. What are some of the things that can you, you could share the top, three top five tips that you would say that um, can markedly improve your kind of results, even though we, we shouldn't really be just thinking about the exam results at the end of the day, we need to be expanding our own kind of education and learning. Um, but as long as we're living in this educational system, we kind of have to play by its rules as well. Agreed. Uh, so the first thing I would say is every, every, every single student in the world should buy and read the book, Make It Stick. The sort of audience you've got on this Discord channel are probably going to be people who would object to buying something online, which means I'm sure they can find a PDF. Like, Make It Stick is the single book that everyone should read. And if you think you have something better to do with your time than to read that book, then you're deluding yourself because, like, it just gives you, it is the Bible about how to study effectively. So the, the very first thing everyone should do is just pause this thing right now. There's, there's no value you, that you're going to get out of <laughs> interview go and torrent make it stick or buy it on kindle or buy an, an actual book or borrow it from the library like whatever it takes to read that book is basically all you need um secondly i've got like a ton of videos on my youtube channel where i basically steal stuff from that book and elaborate on it so you can check those out they're all available for free so essentially the main things are active recall and space repetition active recall meaning testing ourselves and space repetition meaning repeating the sort of repeating the testing of ourselves at spaced intervals over time. And it's all about combating the forgetting curve, which is this phenomenon that as soon as we learn something at an exponential rate, we're going to forget it, sort of like mm. half-lives in, in chemistry and physics. Yeah. And so we want to interrupt this forgetting curve by testing ourselves repeatedly on this information. And we all have this like ridiculous notion that <laughs> sort of we just never really question that in order to learn something, I need to get stuff into my brain. But it's actually the other way around. Like the evidence says that in order to learn something, you need to learn it once and then you need to try and get the information out of your brain. And the act of trying to get information out of your brain is what strengthens the connections between that information or something like that. So those are sort of the two pillars of it. And every other effective study technique is just based around active recall, testing yourself and space repetition, doing that repeatedly over time. So that would be kind of the main thing that I would say. 
I think another area in which I know a lot of students struggle is that it's kind of the story that we tell ourselves. And this is something that they don't talk about in this book, but something that I feel very strongly about. Mm -hmm. Like whatever stage of life we're in, we enjoy telling ourselves the story that the stuff I have to do is really hard. Um, if you're a medical student, then sort of like, like sort of a, a first year medical student, a second year medical student is sort of the extreme end of woe betide me. My life is so hard because I'm studying medicine and it's really, really hard, hard with a capital H. Yeah. But you remember like wh wh whatever stage of life you're at, you know, if you're pre GCSEs, pre O levels, your parents would have told you, oh my God, beta, it's such a big jump from this GCSE minus one to GCSE. And then once you've done your GCSEs, you're like, oh, actually, that wasn't too bad. People are like, oh my God, it's such a big jump to A-levels as well. Like, oh my God, it's such a big jump to university. I think we all love to sell ourselves the story that what we are doing right now is super, super, super hard and like no one in the world is doing it. And I, ha I sold myself that story in my first year of med school. And I realized afterwards that, hang on, this really wasn't that bad. And Partly the reason I found it hard was because I was thinking it was supposed to be hard. I was thinking that when you study medicine at Cambridge, what that looks like is you have these big ass piles of textbook and you have these notes and you're highlighting and you're studying all day and all night. And especially people applying to medicine, like a lot of people listening to this now, if you're thinking of applying to medicine, you're probably selling yourself the story that, oh my God, life as a medical student must be really hard with a big R and a big H. And I think the sooner we can stop thinking that way, the sooner we can think that actually this is very doable, there are hundreds of thousands of medical students in the world at any given time. How hard can it be? <laughs> I think like, that attitude of how hard can it be really, yeah. really helps when it comes to doing these seemingly hard things. And the more we tell ourselves that it's going to be hard, the harder it's actually going to be. You know, stuff like going to the gym, working out, losing weight. These things are not hard. Like you follow a simple set of instructions. If you want to lose weight, you burn more calories than you consume. If you want to get hench, you just progressively lift, lift more and more weights and eat, eat right and you'll get more hench we overcomplicate it. And I think when it comes to studying, we are very guilty of overcomplicating it, partly because our parents can kind of want to sell us the story that, oh my God, Beto, it's really hard. You have to study for eight hours a day. And partly because I think, like I definitely used to get a kick out of that. I used to get a kick out of thinking, oh, I'm a medical student. My, you know, my life is really hard. So that would be kind of the, <laughs> the non, non-standard. Almost like an excuse. Like, I would, I would, would, would that be right? Like we, we, we want to give the, ourselves an excuse that it is hard. And I, I, I'm definitely guilty of feeling the same way um, and I know uh, I'm still at uni. I, I can see that when I when I talk to my med, med students, you know, gosh, we are doing this. We can't we can't go out. We can't do this. No, yeah. we are studying medicine. Um, and and sometimes I, I retaliate by saying, you know, I'm studying math. It's not any easier, than, you know. Yeah, math is um, harder than medicine. You actually have to think in math. In medicine, all you have to do is memorize. Like there is no <laughs> thinking involved. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think I think it's very much an excuse. Um, people love to be like, oh, well, I don't have time to do this because I'm a medical student. Well, you know, look around you. The person who's the captain of the rugby team for the university is also a medical student. He's got time for it. Why don't you? <laughs> so yeah. That is kind of my attitude towards these things. So it's it's almost feels like a mindset shift. And what are those? It's, it's you know, we're, we're changing our perspective and what we think um, about our life. What, what, are, what, are, what, are, what is the mindset or perspective that you... Um, are, are displaying or thinking about right now when you're thinking about um, everything that you do with your YouTubing, your, your kind of entrepreneurial stuff, your, your, all your kind of education and learning part as well? Mm -hmm. So I think there's two things. I think firstly, it's the mindset of how hard can it be? There's that really great quote from, I think, Steve Jobs, which is that if you look around you, everything around you that was, uh, everything that you've got around you was made by people who are no smarter than you are. Um, so that's sort of number one, how hard can it be? And I think the second one is just a mindset of having fun and enjoying the process. Like I think, especially when we're playing the exam results game or the, I want to get into medicine game, mm -hmm. we are very much, we're, we're doing that thing where we say, okay, uh, we're, 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 we're implicitly believing that happiness is going to be found on that next rung of the ladder. It's like the game people play when they get into a corporate job. They're like, I'm just going to stick this out for the next 20 years and then I'll become a CEO and then I'll be happy because then I'll be making money. And that's clearly like a very fallacious way of thinking. Like that's not how life works. Essentially, all we have is the here and now. And so I am huge on enjoying every day on its own merit rather than mm -hmm. just think, thinking that you want to defer happiness up until the point where you become a medical student. Because if you think like that, then sure, you're going to get into medicine. But then during med school, you're going to struggle. You're going to find it really hard. And you're going to think throughout medical school, you're going to think, you know what? Once I graduate, then the struggle will be over. Then I'll be a doctor. Then I'll be saving lives. I'll be earning money. And then my life will be happy. 
And then you become a doctor and you realize that actually it's not all that it's cracked out to be. And actually most people are not enjoying the time as a doctor. And given the choice, most people would probably choose to leave medicine. And you start thinking, ah, okay, well, I guess I, I guess once I finish my training and become a consultant, become fully qualified, then I'll be happy. And then at that point, you're like, well, you know, you're 45 years old now. You've got osteoarthritis in both your knees. Like, you know, <laughs> so <laughs> I think this, uh, if, if I- It's like a never ending that, cycle. Yeah, it's a never ending cycle. It's like sort of climbing the greasy pole. And uh, the greasy pole is very much a thing in, in the corporate world. But I think when it comes to medical life as well, like medical students, doctors and stuff, we also have our own greasy poles to climb. And we think that happiness is going to be found once, uh, like, if only we can get to this point. But actually, no, it's about enjoying things in the here and now. And so for me, like, it's never a struggle, really, to, I mean, it's, it's occasionally a struggle, but it's, it's, it's not much of a struggle to make YouTube videos and to do everything else that I'm doing, because it's fun. Because you're enjoying right. it. If we're just doing it, if if we just do do stuff that we enjoy, it doesn't become work, and it becomes fun, and then you're happy, and you're also achieving something for whatever that's worth. So that's kind of my two yeah. two cents on that. Yeah, I, I was uh, when you were talking about this, it actually kind of brings about our kind of parents' generation, slightly the older generation, not not exclusively. Uh, I, they're definitely like examples in our current generation as well. But a lot of a lot of our um, that the older group of people consider to that um, life is all about like hard work and if you're not working hard and if you're not feeling bad for yourself and if you're not enjoying, if you, if you're enjoying it, you're not really working kind of thing. Um, and it's all about, you know, like grinding, grinding, grinding until you, you kind of like, you know, top over and, and go somewhere else. I want to talk about productivity. I think it's a big, big thing that you talk about. Um, and you've mastered over a, a bunch of years of trying to like cram and get better, at, um, during your university and afterwards as well. Um, and now that you are doing so many things, you're a full-time doctor, you then come back home and release a bunch of YouTube videos. You then manage a company on the side of it um, and have a whole social media following that people are listening to and, and hearing from. You read loads. How, how do you balance it all? Uh, okay, so I think there's two, there's two parts to that. There is kind of what you do in the early stages and then what you do once you, once you start making money, essentially. The, the, the second part of what you do when you start making money is that you start hiring people to help you with all this stuff. You start building a team. But I won't talk about that because I imagine most people listening to this are probably not in the position where they can have like, you know, people working for them. Mm -hmm. So then the question becomes, okay, how do you do that stuff in the early stages? Um, there's a few different things. The first one is to recognize that um, our time is entirely within our control. Like when I'm a medical student or even when, I'm, even when I'm at school. Yeah, so let's say I'm at school. I get home from school at, let's say, 4 p.m. I've got two hours of homework at 6 p.m. I then have five hours of my day left until 11 p.m. where I ideally want to sleep. And let's say I have dinner with the family for an hour. That's four hours. Four hours of my day every single day and like 16 hours on the weekend where I can do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, yeah, <laughs> that is so much time. That is far Like, I had so much free time in school. I had gallons more free time in school than i do now um and most of us i think we squander that time uh i played world of warcraft on average for about three and a half hours a day for about three years i can't <laughs> think 186 days of play time between my warlock paladin shaman and monk over like a three or four year period this was before monks were a thing so just, just this, the three characters over a four year period that is absolutely absurd like i was really happy yeah. doing it and i freaking loved it and like you know my time playing wire was was fantastic but, you know, I just squandered, squandered that time away. Um, and I think once we realize that what we're doing in our with our time is what we are ultimately choosing to do with our time, this excuse of I don't have time becomes no longer a thing. Because we all have time. We just choose to spend it in different ways. I can say I don't have time to go to the gym. Patently false. I could make the time to go to the gym if I wanted to. If the incentive was good enough, like if you offered me a million pounds every time I went to the gym, I would freaking well make the time to go to the gym. Like it's not even a question. Yeah. And equally for everyone in the world who says, I don't have time to do this thing, unless you're a single parent supporting three kids and working four jobs, then maybe you actually physically don't have the time. But for most of the rest of us living in sort of fairly privileged lives, like if you're listening to this on Discord, chances are your life is fairly privileged in one way or another. We all have time in our lives. And so we can do stuff with that time. And I think like once, like as, as long as the stuff that we're doing is fun, then we're spending our time well. Like it's, it's fun making YouTube videos. It's fun writing stuff on the internet. It's fun studying. It's fun doing all these things. So if you can enjoy it, then and life is just great, right? Because everything you're doing is fun. <laughs> so that's essentially my take on the productivity situation. What about reading? Um, I, I think it's, it's something that's sadly 
kind of not as think considered as important as as it, as it in as it used to be in the past. We kind of believe that now that we have Google and and the internet, we can always have everything we want to just like, searchable. Um, and so we don't want to spend time going back and reading even textbooks or or educational books and and trying to like categorize and store facts in our brain. We we think that that will always be available in, in some secondary device like my phone or something like that. Um, you've obviously uh, been a huge champion of reading and and you you read loads you then not only read but then you write about what you read so what kind of what what would you advise us um i don't know like in 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 both ways like what we should be reading and why we should be reading um okay let's start with why why we should be reading um i think i i, I don't think we should treat reading as something particularly hallowed i think we should treat reading as uh, I've I've kind of caught I've started calling every piece of content that I consume these days a nibble, um, mm -hmm. whether it's a book, podcast, article, blog post, essay, whatever. It's all a nibble, um, and these are all kind of pieces of nibbles. Reading is partic is a particularly special nibble, in my opinion, because for less than ten dollars or for free, if you know how to use Google properly to find illegal PDFs, which is what I used to do back in the day. Basically, for free, you've got years if not decades of someone's research compiled down into something that will take you a few hours to read you don't even have to read a whole book you can just read the table of contents you can read the main idea and then you can decide if it's for you like that is absolutely absurd the amount of value that you can get from a book is completely astronomical and i don't think it's a case of sort of memorizing facts as such because you're right you can look up the capital of sudan if you ever want to i don't think that's the sort of fact that you're trying to memorize when you're reading but reading the way I think of it is that reading expands your box. Like we all have this sort of box that we sort of implicitly think within. Mm -hmm. um, if uh, your parents are doctors and stuff, then your box is that you're probably going to become a medical student, be a doctor, and then live a doctor life. Fine. But through reading and through listening to podcasts, you might read books by entrepreneurs, by tech startup founders. And then suddenly, the more of those you read and listen to, the more you realize, hang on, this starting a startup thing doesn't actually seem so bad. Maybe I should teach myself how to code. And all of a sudden, your box has expanded. You might read a book by someone who's traveled the world for five years just with a single backpack. And you'd be like, oh, that sounds interesting. I've never come across that idea before. And all of a sudden, your box has expanded. And so the more you read, the more of these different perspective, perspectives come across your mind, the more you expand this field of possi like realistic possibilities of things that you can do. And so like for me, I say three books that changed my life. One of them was The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss, amazing mm -hmm. book. That was the first, my first introduction to this idea that Actually, we don't have to live this deferred life plan where we work really hard and then we retire and then we live on a beach or something. We can kind of join the new rich and we can generate these sources of passive income. And just that single idea changed the course of my life because then the, ne the next like eight years, uh, the, in the back of my mind, it was like, okay, I want to create these sources of passive income. And had I not read that book, I wouldn't have okay, I've come across that idea. So it wasn't a case of me reading in order to, to memorize. It was a case of me reading to understand a, a different sort of perspective. And so when it comes to, so that's why we should read. It gives us access, access okay. to these perspectives in a way that's like a very efficient way. In terms of what we should read, I think if you struggle with reading, then just kind of read whatever you like, like read whatever interests you. I started reading by reading Harry Potter repeatedly. And the more you read what you enjoy, the more you start to enjoy reading itself. And then you can start reading more useful things or more productive things. But the first step is to just enjoy the things that you're reading. And like these days, I never read something that I'm not going to enjoy because if I start reading it and I don't enjoy it, I close the book and move on to something else. Like there is a world of books out there. And I think a problem with reading is that we consider it work. We're like, oh, I, should, I guess I should probably read Sapiens because everyone's going on about it. Mm. If it, doesn't, if it doesn't, I haven't read Sapiens. It doesn't appeal to me right now. Maybe I'll read it at some point. I'd much rather read some random paranormal romance book about some like werewolf who can t transform into like <laughs> falling in love with some like attractive girl with psychic powers. That is the jam that I love reading. And then occasionally I'll read some product productivity book and be like, oh, I can make eight videos out of the concepts in this book. So <laughs> start with reading whatever you want that takes your fancy, whether it's anime or whether it's romance, whether it's adventure, whether it's Harry Potter on repeat. And then you'll enjoy the act of reading itself. And then you can start reading more useful things. Nice. Nice. I, I'm going to assume that I can't guess that description of the book that you just said. Um, so reading is one part of it. Um, the other part that I, I'm really kind of interested personally to know is there's a writing aspect. You take a, lo a huge, you know, well, huge couple hundreds worth uh, page of book, turn it into a series of kind of clipped ideas or a short video. 
and there's there's an there's an aspect of synthesis of information you're taking sometimes abstract concepts and you're trying to ground it into your own perspectives or your, or your own experiences um what why is it so important to to go from simply kind of i think it, it kind of uh, goes back to the active recall mechanism the fact that you need to actively kind of connect with what you're learning to from, from how, how did you say it like it's not about going into your brain but out of your brain as well um so so how could we like why is it so important to then try to use what we what we're learning into something that we can produce um and it could be as blog posts or it could be as tweets it could be as social media posts whatever it whatever it is okay uh that's a good question um I think I have very different thoughts on that now than I did when I was younger. And actually, one of the things I occasionally get asked, you know, what would you tell your 15-year-old self? Um, and the, the answer would be, I, I, w- I would tell my 15-year-old self, mate, just take some notes in every book that you read, because it'll just be, you'll be really glad for it in 10 years' time. Mm-hmm. Uh, honestly, I, if, if someone is struggling with reading, I wouldn't give them this advice, because the first step is to not struggle with reading. And if you then start applying this extra layer of friction, which is this requirement to actively engage with the material that you're reading, take notes on it, turn it into your own words, publish it as a blog post, that side of things is just way too hard. And if someone is struggling with reading and reads like three books a year, you know, we want to make it as easy as possible to unlock the superpower that is reading without adding too many too much friction to it. As you get more familiar with reading, as you start to, once you've sort of made it beyond a critical mass of kind of the basic literature in your field. Like, for example, if you're into coding and startups, yeah, it makes sense to just sort of read the, the, the 10 most popular books about coding and startups, mm-hmm. and then your knowledge will be at sort of a baseline level. And at that point, you can start being like, okay, let me apply my own insights to this, my own knowledge, my own whatever. It's sort of like being a medical student. Like, while you're a medical student, you don't need to think originally. All you have to do is consume the material that other people have created for you and just kind of memorize it. But then as you become a doctor and you become more specialized, at that point, you start thinking critically about the papers that you're reading. Where did the research come from that this textbook was based on? Is there anything I can do to help help take the field forward? And so I think at the start, me as a 15-year-old, me as a, as a, as a high schooler, um, coming up with novel insights from what I've read probably wasn't going to do anything. But now as a sort of YouTuber and someone in the business of content creation, I have a very vested interest in trying to come up with novel insights from the stuff that I'm reading. Mm-hmm. So I think it's not it's not necessarily I think for a 15 year old getting into reading for the first time, even just thinking of it as writing a book review, like we all wrote book reviews when we were in when yeah. we were like seven and eight about books that we'd read, even just doing that for every book, just like writing a few lines on Goodreads, by the way, really useful to track everything you read on Goodreads. It's really good. Or just like writing an Amazon review about it or just sort of writing a text document or even email to yourself or whatever note taking up you're using that week. Just like writing writing three lines about every book you read, pay dividends in the long run. But it's not advice that I would give to people getting who are struggling with reading because the main main thing to do is just read paranormal romance and start to enjoy reading, and then you'll naturally start doing this stuff as you as you progress. If that makes sense, that does make sense. Yeah. Um, the annoying thing about our our podcast is that like we we love to be productive and say that you know we're going to get this done in the Pomodoro worth of um, time, which is twenty five minutes. Um, but sometimes it's just like oh man, we could we wish we could have asked you more questions. So I want to kind of end this uh, podcast episode slash video thing thing um, by asking about what your your future plans are and especially in an entrepreneurial mindset because you, you talk a lot about entrepreneurship you talk a lot about passive incomes and 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 being I don't know not following the status quo in terms of how you want to go about earning money um, tell us a little bit about what your future plans are uh, yeah sure um, just for the record I'm I'm more than happy to continue if you want to go beyond 25 minutes, but I don't know if this is a requirement of your, of your format. Um, but yeah, future, future plans, entrepreneurship. There's a quote by um, Naval Ravikant, good, good thinker and tweeter and stuff, that I came across a few days ago, which is that uh, the way to live life is to find a hobby that makes you money, find a hobby that keeps you healthy, and find a, a hobby that makes you smarter and more creative. And so I was like, oh, okay, that's like a really good way of thinking about it, because I don't like the idea of work. Like work to me implies some sense of misery. Like work is not supposed to be fun. I like the idea of doing things for fun that happen to make money on the side. And so it's like, for me, like I'm now thinking, okay, what is the hobby that I can do to make money? What is the hobby that I can do to keep fit? And what is the hobby that I can do to kind of exercise my mind and that, and that sort of stuff? So for me, I'm thinking about, do I want to stay in medicine? 
probably not full time. I don't think anyone wants to stay in medicine full time, despite what everyone says. Like, oh my god, medicine is the best thing ever. It's like most people I talk to, if given the choice, would love to go part time. So I think at this point, maybe two or three days a week being a doctor would be quite fun. Sort of a hobby that happens to make some money. I'm leaning towards emergency medicine on that front because it's very suitable for that sort of lifestyle. And I'm thinking, what do I want to do on the side? I love playing badminton and squash and tennis more recently, so I would do more of that. Um, and in terms of the creative side of things, I want to continue producing stuff on the internet because creating content on the internet is really fun and cool and you get to connect with lots of interesting people like you, Zabir. Uh, I'm also super into music, so I'm trying to learn music theory these days. I want to get into music production. There's a YouTuber called Kurt Hugo Schneider, who has been yeah. my kind of muse for the last sort of 10 plus years. Like he's the dude I wanted to be when I started out on YouTube. Um, he plays <laughs> lots of instruments. Of music. And to, to, like yeah. the way he kind of like messes around with like weird instruments. Didn't he do like a Coca-Cola bottle thing? Yeah. Thing? It's pretty <laughs> yeah, amazing. He's like he's so, so talented and really cool. And he's, he, I, 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 I want to be like him when it comes to music production. <laughs> uh, but I'm at the very start of that journey. So I'm very excited about kind of where that's going to take. Because, you know, in the immortal words of Miley Cyrus, it ain't about how fast you get there. Ain't about what's waiting on the other side. It's the climb. Uh, it's all about the climb. It's about enjoying the journey, uh, journey before destination, as is one of the uh, uh, the uh, the commandments of the Knights Radiant in the uh, uh, the Stormlight Archive, f- fantastic series of books. Um, so I'm I'm just kind of thinking journey before destination. It's the journey that, that matters, and I'm trying to enjoy the journey as much as I can, while also making money on the side because everyone needs to make money somehow. So yeah. that is sort of how I'm thinking about it. Journey before destination. That's such a powerful thing to to go away with because um, I, I'm definitely someone or, or have been for for a while that keeps kind of thinking about you know once I get this done I'll be feeling better once I get my degree once I finish my final two exams I'll be happier um, but yeah that's super 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 insightful and um, I don't know uh, if you have the time then maybe we should just keep going if if and we can maybe make it a bit more informal. Um, Oh, I've got the time. Check out. This check is actually out good. I'm, I'm recording this as we're going along, which means this is sort of content creation for me because then my team can chop it up into bits for my Instagram. So <laughs> I have a vested interest in this in this kind of being longer than quite <laughs>